going to turn on the Okay. All right. Back to normal here. So, how many times, and I'm going to go to the uh, next slide here, how many times have you found yourself in a grocery store or a Home Depot um, looking at products on the shelf that visually have very different colors? One example that I clearly remember uh, that matches this specific uh, picture, uh, many years ago uh, when I was shopping for Uncle Ben's rice. I were probably thinking I should probably get a life if this is a prime example of my past memories. But um, anyway, it's a uh, vibrant orange corporate color of Uncle Ben's. It's probably one of the most recognized corporate colors we can all envision. I remember looking boxes on the shelf in this grocery market. And similar to this picture, seeing little boxes that were very bright, vibrant orange, what I expected. Uh, and what I associate with Uncle Ben's price. I also saw that there were other boxes that were a dull and somewhat lackluster orange, and to varying degrees. Being where I, I chose the bright, vibrant orange over the other boxes. And in hindsight, and thinking about that, my impression was that the dull colored boxes were probably older, and the brighter, more vibrant boxes were uh, more recently put on the shelf. So, of course, I want the the newest that's on the shelf, um, so that's what I chose. And this is an example of, of you know, accurate and consistent brand color. You know, definitely and clearly affects buyer behavior. At the same time, it presents a very large challenge to uh, packaging printers. So I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to present some of the, uh, the, the Flexo package printer challenges. And, and to a lot of you out there, this is going to be very uh, obvious because uh, you run into them, um, which is probably why you're, you're attending the seminar. Uh, I want to preface this with the, the, what I'm going to, to review here or go over are the values and some of the key elements. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to get into every element uh, that will, we will grow this and we will uh, present uh, other webinars in the future that gets, digs down even deeper. So let's start with uh, what you're experiencing today uh, are consumers that have become extremely brand aware and very color critical. Uh, we've all heard of the Coca-Cola red uh, requirements. Um, those actually, you know, from my earliest memories in the print industry, which I've been in for about 25 years, um, I, you know, Coca-Cola has very stringent, okay, you will, the cans are printed the same, Coca-Cola had the packaging, you know, it has proliferated uh, throughout our industry and really raised the bar for, for uh, our, our packaging printers. And a challenge on how to maintain consistent and accurate color brand color. When a single or repeat customer job, um, and the challenge really is, is increased when it's printed in multiple press locations. Uh, an example, you know, Uncle Ben's Rice, for instance, when, when that's printed, they actually have a 24-hour from print to being on the truck and um, traveling to uh, the grocery market that it's going to be stocked in. Um, Domino's pizza boxes, I know, are printed in multiple locations by multiple vendors. So it'll challenge on how, how do you get those colors to consistent and accurate across different facilities or multiple, what I call multiple press locations. And currently, oftentimes, the customer expectations are not being met. Why? That's the part we're going to get into. Historically, the eye has been really the only method that uh, is utilized for checking color accuracy. As we know, it's highly subjective. Uh, one person to another, the way they see color is different. And inaccurate. Uh, a lot of other variables as far as lighting, 
um, you know, how late you up the night before, you know, there's just so many variables involved uh, that, that it's, it's hard, to, hard to figure out how to tie that together. Now take that in one location and multiply it. So now you're, you have multiple prep locations, multiple facilities that have to match color to the customer's requirements. A uh, factoid or statistic is, is that um, I think is actually larger at this point is 60% of brand perception depends on color accuracy. That was a packaging printing survey uh, done back in 2009. And the color quality assurance process becomes more of a business exercise than a technical one. The technical ability to do this is there. Whether companies choose to implement um, or to value um, or will invest in implementing this process. That's that's the true business exercise, and that's that's a few things, that, a few of the things that I want to go through. Looks like we have a lot of questions coming in, and I just want to remind people that we will be addressing all of the questions at the end of the webinar. But please keep them coming. Um, let us know that you're really engaged. Thank you, Allison. And yes. Keep, keep the questions coming. We will be fielding them um, at the end uh, of the presentation. So let me review the, the current process. And this is a very simplistic diagram of what happens when a customer order is generated. And basically, it's, it's generated, job is created, and distributed in this example, Oregon, Florida, and Texas. Individual print facilities will go out and, based on the customer requirements, have ink um, formulated um, for that job. Now, as you may guess or may, may, may all understand, obviously, when, you, when you're using different ink suppliers, different locations, um, formulate ink, uh, it, is, it will not always formulate to the same Values. Now, to, to ink companies' uh, defense, it's impossible to actually formulate ink that will exactly match um, colors that were printed before. Um, there's always going to be some level of variance. The trick is how to verify that the ink you're getting is in the customer tolerance. That's the real trick, and that's the real challenge here. So let's, let's go through the steps on implementing a, a color QA process. Um, I consider these some of the most vital. Uh, one is creating and managing customer jobs. Another is how to manage ink and color libraries. I think a key component uh, is to remove the subjectivity, the subjective nature of visually your eye judging color accuracy and and implementing a more empirical process of using a spectral photometer to actually take measurements. And here what's very important is uh, not only to measure color, but let's look at the trend. Let's, let's do a trend analysis of the press's performance on individual and multi-press locations that are printing the same job to see how well they're performing. And we'll go through these items uh, one by one. So step one, and I'm, I'm putting these in steps um, in somewhat order. What's really important is creating and distributing the print of information that contains all required information, the color values, the target tolerances, Everything a printer needs to be able to print that job and be able to ensure that it is color accurate uh, and meets the customer expectations. So creating the, the, the cover job and then actually having the ability to post it to a centralized area, a centralized server on the internet, that multiple press locations that are printing the same or repeat job have access to so they can all use the same target color tolerances and values. 
state obvious this will enable them in a multi-press location situation um, to all be working on the same page using the same color settings, the same tolerances, same information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through step by step the uh, managing a customer job um, from our perspective. Now, you know, open up with customer information. Some of this is going to be mundane that you're already doing, obviously, obviously you're already doing, uh, but since it's my webinar, I'm going to do it anyway, just because I want to show you completely uh, what needs to uh, happen. Uh, first thing is obviously the, the customer information. Name, customer, contacts, all the requisite information specific to this customer job. Oftentimes, a, a, obviously, a unique ticket number. It's going to be in colors. Okay, what what are you know? It's a five color job. What are the designated in colors? Again, this is much already being done as far as you're, you're telling the customer. Uh, you're being told if you are the customer, the printer, that uh, these are the ink colors that you're going to be using. What I've found in dealing with a lot of different packaging printers is that the metrics for measuring, in other words, the, 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 what the customer is looking for for information that they want to get out of this press run varies. Some want to see only solids. Others want to measure for dot gain. Some very specifically want to do 2%, 25, 50, 75. So having the color bar specific to that customer's needs, including the job information, is important because it's, it's finding the information that the customer wants to get at the end of that um, press run. To me, one of the most important are color tolerances. Having the colors, color reference colors, that you're, going, that you're using to compare when printing on the press. Having the delta E tolerance, so in other words, what, what level of accuracy do you have to print in? What your target customer target densities are per color. Density range. And I'll just quickly go through gray balance, prints, Interesting side note, and interestingly enough, by the way, is we're, we're also in, uh, encountering customers who now have uh, not just how well a overprint is trapped, but what delta E is. Well, it is you're trying to get to a certain color value. And uh, the last are your tints for dot gain, what, uh, what those values are, how much allowable dot gain will you allow for dot gain. So this is all information that, that needs to be shuttled to all the different print facilities so they can actually go and, and have the information they need um, to print the job and check it. Posting customer job information, you know, basically what you want to get is, and there are a number of solutions out there, um, is a software solution that's going to post that job information that's created by the quality control manager, press room manager, pre-press manager, or could be the pressifier. It gives them the ability to remotely create that job, set job, and the solution would then go and distribute all that information on the customer, the tolerances, the color values to the various press facilities that was going to be printed at. So they all have the information, okay? They have the values. What happened next? Well, for on one of my earlier slides, I showed how that uh, you know the individual print facilities were going and um, they're going to their ink companies and they're having their, their the ink formulated and they're getting them back and they're visually looking against what, what the uh, customer has signed off on, which you know, what the customer signed off on could be something to the effect of a 
something that previously printed, a previously printed job. It could be an ink drawdown. Um, it could be any number of things. But again, it's, it's a visual subjective method. So one of the things is let's make sure that your ink is the right color. And do that. Use the spectral photometer and measure it. Measure it against the customer-approved color target and get the actual custom color library that's going to be used on press. Now, there's also a way to, if the customer does not have a actual color target that they're specifying, but they're supplying with a physical visual target, well, that's where you measure that physical visual target of the ink drawdown of the previously printed piece and create that target reference value that you're going to use to, to make sure that the color on press is accurate. This, the view of, beauty of doing it this way is you can an, analyze the inks that are being formulated to make sure that they are the correct values before you hit the button and start the press. The last thing you want to do is, is get everything inked up, everything's rocking and rolling, and you figure out there's a problem, and now you have to backtrack and figure out what's wrong, and, and it could be just a matter of the specific for, you know, ink they're using is not uh, accurate. Again, I want to stress that ink is never the same from batch to batch. Um, uh, the other thing I want to mention is the ability to import and export color libraries in common formats. There are a lot of software packages, ink formulation software out there that that you need to be compatible with because a lot of different vendors are being used to generate ink. There are a lot of different quality control software solutions out there that you want. They, they need to be able to use this information. And when you're creating a customer a color vary, um, your ink vendor is going to want to get that data that will help them formulate that ink accurately. So compatibility of being able to import and export these color libraries is, is a very key key element. Step three, measure color. How do you determine a color is accurate unless you're measuring it? And a famous statement. So the the ideal you can measure a color in real time so you can catch whether the color the density, or there are substantial dot gain variations early in the print process. Now, Flexol presses, roll-to-roll -roll presses, you know, measuring color in real time, and again, this is the idea would be to have an actual uh, spectral photometer that is mounted on the press itself, giving you real-time live measurements um, so you can audit how well or monitor how well a press run is actually um, perform it to the customer tolerances. Now, that's a deal. Um, but at the same time, uh, getting the information, even if it's post process, is important because uh, you want to basically be able to when there are problems. Let me just up on the real time for a second. Picture a role and your, your current method or your current printing method is you don't really find out that, that colors. The color went off into left field and way out of customer tolerance halfway through a roll. You find out at the end of a roll. So real time measuring, you know, you hear is if you catch mistakes in real time, not mistakes, all advantages in real times, then that means you make the decision to stop, thus saving half a roll of paper and, and a lot of ink. Take corrective action, or if you've seen the density problems, you know having the ability to go ahead and add extender maybe to the you know, change the viscosity of the bucket of ink you happen to be using. Um, you know, it just gives you the ability to catch problems early, and it's removing subjectivity by measuring the color rather than you know, with an instrument rather than with the human eye. Um, but measure, measuring is extremely important. I don't want to minimize, by the way, that the, the fact that you don't just measure, you do also visually want to look um, at what's 
being printed. So you, that's subjective. I want to look at it, but you also want to empirically make sure that the, the measured value, measured what's being printed is, is within tolerance. There you go. Uh, the deal is you have that customer information, and you've already sent this to the various print locations in Florida, Oregon, Texas, and Illinois. In real time, as they are taking measurements, what happens is again, every measurement is automatically being uploaded to a quality software server and relayed back to the quality manager, press room manager, maybe the print specifier. So they can in real time actually look at how a press is performing. Imagine. Imagine being a quality manager sitting in your office and you see um, you see something substantially go out of tolerance and getting on the phone down in the press room going, whoa, stop. You know, take, take a monitor. So it gives the ability to actually monitor in real time. One of the things that, that, that we've, I'm sure you've all experienced, I know I've seen several times, are customers, they're getting more color savvy anyways, as I've mentioned earlier, and it's no longer a matter of trusting that a job that's 500,000 impressions or a million impressions is accurate based on you, know, you, the printer, saying this is accurate. No more, they're saying, you know what, I really want to see the data. I want to understand and see proof that that, oh, that press run it met my metrics. It met my tolerances. It's important to provide that information along with the job to get back to the customer. And information that, that, that you typically want to bundle back to that customer or give them access to, by the way, another nice thing about having a software solution is you don't necessarily have to print out a report and uh, put it to them or provide it to them, you know, in hard copy form, you can actually set it up to have them log in and get it right after the job's done if that's what you want to do. So job audit report, all the customer information, um, the overall analysis per color, and this is an average analysis. So for instance, in this screen it's saying, okay, cyan and density, it was overall and average throughout the press run. It would color though point of the whole, whole thing, and uh, yet your dog was out as well. So it's giving you an average uh, accumulated uh, a, a synopsis, an analysis of how well it performed on colors, uh, or prints, so on and so forth. Then you want to dig a little, little deeper and say, okay, again, it's, it's average, but it's digging deeper on, okay, on the individual colors, what the actual Target data was, okay, my target density was 1.39, my edge measured was 1.31, and based on my range that I specified my target tolerances, it, it failed. So it goes through on density and it, go, and it analyzes, gives you all the information you need to understand that your tolerances were used, passed or failed, and your dot gain density as well as your uh, color metric, your colors. Now, just thing to note that I, I always like to note is, is on the color metric analysis, to me, color is the main metric here in a lot of ways because in the end result, that's what you're targeting. That's what you're shooting for is accurate color. So although some things may, may, uh, may have failed overall, may have passed color metrically, and that's, that's, that's something to keep your eye on. This question just came in, and I feel like it's a it's a great one to address right now. This one wants to know if, other than average data, is it possible to get the individual actual scanned data? So that's actually a really good question, Allison. Um, yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, mo uh, some actually it depends on the specific solution that you choose. Um, a lot of the the uh, solutions that are out there for monitoring. Uh, color quality and tracking it um, do offer the ability to export the actual individual scan data. So if you want to get it in spreadsheet format, 
all the color data and you know measure target dot gain analysis. Um, a lot of the solutions out there do provide that. That's probably a very important question when you're considering which solution to purchase. Um, well, you can get that that, that data. And, and what's important is that, that, as I mentioned very early on, different customers like to get uh, reports on different things. Okay, they look they, the way they cut up the data and analyze it um, be very different customer to customer. So our data which also, incidentally, gives you the ability to interface with other applications that are out there um, in the world. Uh, it, it gives you that capability to actually offer that data so it can be imported to, into other applications and utilized however the customer wants it. Okay, so just in the job audit report, uh, topping analysis, gray balance in it great balance of analysis is very important. Again, just to give you a reality check on how it went and to be able to prove to the customer it's accurate. Okay, it's four and a half. Make sure the audience is still awake. <laughs> All of you still awake, please raise your hands. Okay, just, uh, just checking. I really can't see you anyways, but uh, I know death by PowerPoint can be a painful <laughs> and diagonal death. I just want to assure you that we're actually getting through this and approaching the Q&A session, so uh, fear not. Uh, we, will, we will get through this, and the sound of my voice will leave well, at some point here, and you can ask any questions. Okay, to analysis. Um, Cole Nellis, who is a, he's a certified G7 expert and co-chair of the Graphical Committee and extremely well-known throughout the print industry, um, the process is the most complicated mechanical part of the process, and because of this, it is part of the manufacturing process that deserves the most attention. In most plants, press conditions are constantly changing. It should not come as a surprise to find out that the press deserves a lot of attention. Again, stating the obvious, but here's the challenge. How do you know how when your, your press really needs it? Attention. And to me, one of the, the key elements is tracking how your, your press is performing, especially in a multi press location environment. So, whatever system you choose, you want to make sure that it, it, for the individual job, it provides a visual trend analysis so you can track the press performance and adhere to the customer tolerances uh, and throughout the whole press run. In addition to that, you want to really see over time how well does the press perform and same, you know, the same recurrent print jobs are using the same colors in multiple locations. Having the ability, first of all, to see in these multiple locations in this, you know, instant, in this particular case, you know, Massachusetts, Kentucky, New York, Florida, Texas, and California and see how well it performed. In this instance, you can look at Kentucky and say, okay, uh, density anyways, you know, you, you did not pass here, but in the other locations it did. So being able to drill down and seeing how many scans were done, and seeing the color information as well as density, and how well the performance was done. This is going to really indicate whether we are starting to encounter a true press problem that needs to be addressed could see a trend of a, a constant, you know, out of tolerance condition. And I'm going to put a side note here. When you're, you're evaluating whether you're in or out of tolerance, don't wait until you're out of tolerance to, to take corrective action. Very important. If you see there's a trend towards, and I'm going to go back um, to my previous one. If you see a trend, and this is not a good example, but say it starts, the trend starts out, you know, starts out low and then starts increasing, don't wait until it gets to the average tolerance. Start looking at, okay, I know based on this trend, I'm going to go out of tolerance. Let's see what the problem is and start doing some analysis right away. 
real-time data analysis is, is, is just such an important tool. Multiple job, job trend analysis, and again, having remote access through a server to, to the principal parties is important. Here's you know, a synopsis of what we've covered. I mean, basically, it's, it's, it's the overall implementation of a color quality assurance process, which to me is, is something that's not, not only critical, it, it's required in today's packaging market. Um, you know, graphic printing. Uh, package print has just come leaps and bounds in quality that now everybody uses the term offset quality. And it's very true. So, but our tools on a FlexiGraphic Press are limited on how to do that. So, monitoring and really evaluating what's happening on press and catching problems early is important. It's going to reduce the number of remakes that you have to do which it's going to substantially reduce the cost through the savings of ink and paper wastage. I made up the word white wastage. I'm not sure if it's really a word or not, but again, my webinar, I get to, to add words to the dictionary. I told Bob to take that out. But. He did, she did, but uh, I, I couldn't. Um, so, you know, minimizing the amount of ink and paper that's wasted, that, that you know, catching a problem mid-roll versus at the end of a roll is a prime example. This is also going to increase the satisfaction and what you have your customers, because you're going to meet their color requirements. They're not going to go someplace else, someplace else when they're happy. And it will reduce the overall labor costs and increase the operational efficiency. Another thing I don't have listed here is it, it's also going to increase your ability to attract higher level customers. In other words, if you're doing a good enough color now, if you can offer the ability to do critical brand color, attract a higher level of customer, um, and be able to prove it, you'll be able to demonstrate it. You know, I'd like to take the rest of the allotted time to answer questions. Um, I, I thank you, by the way, for, for attending. Um, we had a very good turnout. Um, I also want to stress the fact that you can feel free to contact me um, if you have additional questions this webinar uh, or Tashcon products. Um, that's my uh, email address and my phone number. Uh, and again, I, I welcome any, any communications you wish to have. Uh, please do not hesitate to, to contact me. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Allison. And I just wanted to say thank you to Bob and also that this webinar will be recorded and it will be on our website, uh, hopefully, oh, sure. by tomorrow or the next day. Um, so we have a lot of great questions here coming in. And we can go through them now. Yep. Uh, can you just uh, hold on for a second there, Allison? Sure. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead. Uh, Allison, go ahead and ask some questions, and I'll do my utmost to try to, to um, answer them. Uh, the first question that we have is, how do you check the color tolerance of the ink that the printer receives from his ink supplier? You know, the uh, getting back to what what is uh, supplied to you by the ink supplier. Um, what what the supplier is going to do is they're going to formulate to the specification. Um, actually, I'll back up even further. Customers apply you an ink drawdown, or they make a previously printed piece. And what you can do then is you can take measurements and supply that data to your to your ink vendor. Um, when your ink vendor comes back and supplies you with the ink that you're going to use on the job, uh, I heavily suggest uh, doing an ink drawdown. Uh, doing an, an ink drawdown on the actual material that you're going to be printing on. Because the, the ink supplier does not have the luxury of ha always having the material you're going to be using to print on. So even if they supply an ink drawdown, 
it won't necessarily be on the paper you're printing on, and the color of paper affects the color of the ink. So do an ink auto on the material you're going to be printing, and then take your spectral photometer and take a measurement and see that that ink is indeed falling within the customer, customer specified tolerances, or if not, to go back to your ink vendor and say, you know, we have a problem. Um, probably your best approach. Thanks, Bob. Um, just want to let everyone know that you, you can continue to type in your questions, and it it seems like we may have lost a few here. If if you don't hear your question, please feel free to type it in again. Um, the second one we have is if the ink is within the tolerance, then what do you need to monitor the color while the press is running. Okay, that's a good one. Um, there's a number of reasons, and one of the, the main ones is that even if your ink is in tolerance, as you're printing and ink's flowing, all the variation, mechanical variations that you're going to encounter, the analux rollers, the the, the um, you know, there's, there's so many variables that will affect how that ink is being laid down on, on the material you're printing on that... Uh, you need to monitor the color. You need to make sure that that something uh, has not ha happened in on the press or in the press to cause it to drift. And that's the real answer: is you need to monitor it because there always will be things that will happen that uh, that will will cause uh, changes. Press one. Great. The third question we have is, how do you correct for color inaccuracy while the press is running? Yeah, that's, a, that's always, a, especially for flexographic printing, that's always a challenge because the ability to adjust uh, for, uh, you know, color variation is limited. I mean, you have viscosity, you have pH, you have analog rollers, tension, um, you know, so there are things that you already know and are doing. You know, you can swap in a new bucket of ink. That's not a problem. Really, uh, what the, the main thing is, is um, what this is key to the whole process is monitoring color, catching when the color goes out. It's, it's when you don't catch that and you go through just rolls of paper, buckets of ink, just to find out at the end of it that it does not, um, it does not meet your or the customer's uh, expectations, and you're caught in a situation where the customer's unhappy and you're unhappy because you have to redo the job. So you do the things you will do, um, uh, but uh, at the same time, the real key here is monitoring the uh, press run. Great. The fourth question that we have is, can my ink supplier tell me how accurate the ink they are supplying really is? Okay. Um, yes, the answer is yes. I mean, they when when they when ink vendors are producing ink, um, they have uh, spectrophotometers and they can they actually supply. You know, you could you have them do an ink drought on or what have. They can supply based on that formulation and what they they produce. How far off from the actual tolerance the ink they're formulating is. Now, and, and I just want to mention that that impossible for an ink vendor to manufacture, manufacture an ink or formulate an ink that's going to hit it dead on. So that would be a bad expectation to ever expect an ink vendor to be able to hit it dead on. Um, so matter of how close they are, but because if, if they're you know, one delta one delta e off from the specified tolerance, and your customer's tolerance is two delta. That gives you what I call okay, wiggle room. That gives you one delta E's worth of wiggle room. In other words, you're already off at delta E. You only have two. So you have a very narrow window to meet that customer's tolerance. So most, the more accurate you can get your ink formulated, the wiggle room you have uh, to deal with color. And uh, you know, typically what rule of five I've seen out there is anywhere up to a delta E uh, maximum is what you would really want to uh, settle for. Again, it, 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 
we're, we're, I'm going to split hairs on critical color versus good enough color because there's a big difference between those two. Another question that just came in, what do you mean by real time? Real time is, and, and I'll just, uh, again, I, uh, this is for, I don't want to make this a, a pro, uh, test con specific product oriented uh, webinar, um, but I'll give an example. We have an inline product that goes right directly on a flexographic press that can um, actually take all the color dot gain density measurements in real time during production. So true real time means that we're printing have the ability with the uh, inline spectrophotometer to take measurements and in time be able to see what's happening. And it comes back to that the two half a roll or a quarter of a roll and something happens that you, you, you need to know about, well, in, with the line spectrophotometer, you're going to see it immediately and be a corrective act, action, including stopping the press. Great. Uh, another one here just came in. Can spectrophotometer read data on a me metallized material? Yeah, and the answer is yes. Um, you can read uh, a metallicized material. Um, what what uh, what you read a metallicized uh, material is is sort of important. On all of our on I'll just again I'm not just specifically, but just overall, what you can do um, um, metallic to get accurate metallic measurement readings is. Use a polarization filter because the big thing about a spectrophotometer is it's basically flashing a light and it's bouncing it off the surface of the material and it's that reflected light. Some of it's being absorbed and more, you know, other of it's being bounced right back up to the spectrophotometer where that amount of light is being measured. When you get a really metallic substance or, or ink um, or foil or somewhat, um, you're obviously going to get a lot of reflected light back. And for highly reflective surfaces, what ha surfaces, um, the polarizing filter will help filter out what I would call an, an over-reflected light amount of light, and that, that's what uh, that's what enables you to uh, measure metallic surfaces. Great, thank you for these great great questions. I'll wait a second here to see if any others come in. Um, yep, yeah, we have another one here that just came in. How often should I take measurements on a flexo press run? Well, you know, that's a good question. Um, obviously, you know, I wouldn't suggest trying to take uh, a measurement for every uh, impression, um, especially if you're using an inline. You, you would basically have thousands of scan uh, results that you would have to go through. Um, I would say that, that, you know, you'd have to You'd have to decide based on the run length somewhat. You know, one 500 for sh maybe a shorter length, one at 1,000, one at 2,000. Um, it really depends because if you're doing a 500 million impression um, press run, um, taking even every 500, you know, do the math on how many scans that is and how much data that you'll have to wade through. Um, I'd, I'd say base your, your amount of scans that you do on the run length. Now, the big thing is taking fairly regular measurements along the overall run length of that that uh, at that run uh, to make sure that something doesn't happen uh, midway. It's going to cause you to, uh, to to have to stop the press, or you're not going to catch it, and you're going to waste a lot of ink and paper. Great. Well, I will give it another second here to see if any other questions pop up. But just as a reminder, the record the webinar will be on our website. If you have any other questions, I think Bob put up his contact information. You can feel, give, um, feel free to give Bob a call or send an email. And there were any, we had a couple of um, very specific questions that we will plan to send you an individualized email. If you had a very specific product question, um, please note that we'll send you an individual email so that you can um, take a look at that.
it's like maybe one or two. Okay. I've got uh, through um, a, 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 couple, a chat session, we have some uh, actual other questions. Um, so what's, uh, let's see, typical color tolerances. Uh, let me think about that. I know that that challenge is what are your typical color tolerances, and and, and it seems like the, the the overall. Okay, let me back up. The customer who is critical, you know, a critical color customer, um, the number that seems to always pop up is a two delta E tolerance, which. Uh, may be attainable or unattainable uh, based on the material you're printing on um, and a lot of factors. I know that there's been customers who said, well, I want to point five delta E tolerance. And, and to me, that's an unrealistic delta E to maintain on in almost any environment. So what, what the most common is two delta E's uh, that I've heard, but I, the, the, you know, when you're printing on corrugated versus a transparent material uh, or versus a uh, high quality coated stock, you know, you have to figure out what what tolerances are going to work best. So starting out with a tolerance, let's just say, let's pick a tolerance of say three on a on a film material. And then this trend analysis becomes important because being maintain that level of accuracy is the challenge. Can you? Do you have the physical capability based on the material, based on the inks? It's a matter of, of educating and setting the customer expectations um, correct based on that. So that's sort of the answer is the industry seems to come up with this magic number two, which is below two. You know, it, you don't really see a lot of difference in color below two. Uh, via the human eye, above two as that number gets higher, you you see a uh, difference in color. There's another question that came in, Bob. Can UV inks be controlled as accurately as solvent-based inks with this system? I mean, it, what what we're talking about here is, is color. It, it's about regardless of whether they're UV inks, whether they're solvent-based inks. Um, as far as control, I can't speak to that because what, how you control um, solvent-based inks, how you can, um, and how you control UV inks, um, it's like graphic to offset to gravure to all the different print technologies. What, what we're seeing here is you can monitor that color. You can find out regardless of the technology or the uh, type of ink, whether the, those inks or the, the job is within that. And that's, that's the important piece to focus on. The inks won't, won't really uh, matter as much as being able to monitor the actual print, the, the printed material. Um, what else do we have, Allison? Uh, oh, we have another one here. Actually, two more just came in. The first one is, what is the backing I should use to take measurements, and what is the difference between black backing and white backing? Okay, good question. Um, the backing should, you can use either a black or a white backing. Um, a lot of this, uh, what the whole print industry, what consultants and what we suggest, it's all about uh, uh, printing to standards. Because once you start printing to standards, then that, that gives you the ability to control, um, especially in a multi print environment, um, you know, well those jobs are going to perform because you're going to be printing to set standards. So, for instance, there is an ISO standard for backing and white backing. There's, uh, there's, there's, there, are all, there are different standards, you know, grackle standards. So, Real, what you want to do is, um, I, and I would say far ISO seems to be one of the most uh, utilized and, and also instantly, uh, met the other standards tend to match very closely. Uh, I, would, I would say use something to the effect of an ISO standard for your black or white backing. As far as which one you use, it doesn't matter. 
So another other question is, uh, that I'm, I just saw that just popped up is, we are going to change Pantone colors for LAB values in the future. And I'm not sure what exactly that means. Um, I mean, Pantone, the, the Pantone, there, there is a digital Pantone color library uh, that is available right from, uh, right from, believe it or not, Amazon.com, <laughs> as well as uh, um, the own site, where you actually, for around $50, buy the, the, the actual Pantone lab, libraries that have the digital LAV values. Um, one thing that brings up a good point, by the way, I'm, I'm going to point out is that when using color swatch books, um, or, or let's say using Pantone libraries, oftentimes a customer will say, well, based on what you're seeing in your Pantone color library or based on TCMI or, or just a color swatch book, this is the color I want to use. The things to be cautious of is that, like all printed material, there is variability um, from swatch book to swatch book. So if you're using one swatch book, um, and then looking at the swatch book, that can cause some disparity. And let's say you take the, you know, the customer signs off on a, on, on a swatch book color. In the press, you have uh, uh, the same swatch book, but it's you know it's a different version, uh, plus printed in a different location, and uh, it won't always match up completely. And if, if that's the, the color you're using uh, to measure, it may not completely match up. So so be cautious when a customer says. I want to use a specific swatch book for color, so let's say a Pantone 386C for coding. Um, if, you, you, if the customer is not using a di the digital library with a digital value, they're just using what they're seeing on a, a swatch book, it may not match up. So you really need to make sure that if they're picking it out of a swatch book and using the actual digital library or you're taking measurement from a different swatch book, that you take a measurement and make sure it matches up to what the customer signed off on. There's just one more, which might be similar to another question. Deal with tolerances on UV inks. Uh, that was the same. That was the same, same question. Okay. Yeah. Same answer to that, and, and it, same same deal as before. Is uh, a lot of it's based not on the specific inks that are technology. It's it's based on the customer's expectation expectations and their set tolerances. Determines that. What we're saying is it's all about monitoring and catching colors that fall outside those customer tolerances. Well, that's great. Lots of great questions. Thank you all so much. And I, I see one that uh, one uh, someone who wants uh, my contact info again. I'm just going to uh, send to all participants um, my contact info. And once I all attendees. Uh, again, my name is Bob Burns, and I am the Director of uh, Technical Services, and I welcome uh, your um, contact anytime. I can't answer the question, which I definitely don't know anything, and I want everybody to understand that, uh, uh, but still feel free to um, contact me, and if I, I don't know it, I'll find out what the answer is. I missed a seven. No, she's right. I type horribly. Okay. Boom. Are there are any other questions that we can answer here that we did not? Okay. I want to thank you all again. I'll hand this back to Allison, and uh, I'm pretty much done, I think. Yeah, I think we, we'd like to wrap it up for today. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on the webinar and the information that we've provided. Um, please feel free to contact us. Bob just gave you his contact information again. Or visit our website. And thank you all for your time. Thank you very much.